Bob, I, I can't do anything about the effective. Uh, I can't dance and I can't talk about images and I can't talk about the mystical. And uh, I could do something about the spatial, but uh, I thought I, and talk about how California was the center of the financial meltdown. But uh, Bob, Bob said, well, why don't you do something, you know, we need a little material, uh, tangible materiality here to go along with these other speakers, um, which seemed very boring, so I fooled him, and I decided to do actually a rethinking of Marxist theory of money and capital. And I did that because I've recently been reading Jeff Ingham's great book, uh, The Nature of Money, which is a real challenge to Marxism. And I also did it because I think uh, where the financial crisis is a challenge to all of us uh, to think of, rethink money and finance, which is what we're doing uh, in these sessions, money, finance, and capital. So how do we explain the financial crisis? How do we explain the growth of finance capital? I don't think we can do either of those very well in Marxism as it stands. Obviously, orthodox economics is hopeless, so that's not going to be any help. But you'd think Marxism could help us, but I'm afraid it's less useful uh, than we'd like, certainly than I'd like as an old Marxist. So we need to rethink it. So I'm going to do 10 propositions on money. And actually, I'm going to cheat because I snuck in an extra one. But you know, money is self-expanding, so, so are my propositions. And the first bunch are about the nature of money. Oh, I can't see anything. Are on the nature of money and its relative autonomy and self-expansion. Then I have a number of propositions about money and capital and how uh, money mobilizes capital and capital mobilizes money. And then I'll have some propositions about capitalist money and the self-expansion of uh, the circuit of M, M prime. And then I'll finish with a couple of comments about finance capital and finance capitalism. So money in the economy, first proposition. Uh, money in orthodox economics is treated as a veil. Uh, in, in Marxist economics, it's treated as a kind of reflection of the real economy. Now, I'm going to use this term real economy, even though money's real because it's kind of a standard terminology. Don't take it too literally. So we have a real problem with conventional economics and Marxist economics. Now, there is a long tradition of dissenting monetary theory that goes back to at least the English Revolution, which Ingham and others have traced. Um, and in our time, mostly uh, reappears with Keynes and his discussion of the power of money to stimulate the economy and to lead capitalist investment. And that, that tradition continues with Minsky, who's been revived, who was in obscurity for years, but now is everybody's hero because he did talk about the autonomy of the financial and the very strong possibility of financial crises. And Minsky was actually a PhD at Berkeley, so I guess we can lay some claim there. So um, what I want to do is kind of marry this sort of theory of the autonomy of money, the sort of post-Keynesian dissenting theory, with a Marxist theory. And to really have a certain dance of money in the economy, or a dialectic of money in the economy, to bore, be sound boringly Marxist. And now this isn't quite Randy's kind of dance, because I can't do that. But I think intellectually, there is a very interesting dance. It may be as interesting as Randy's uh, discussion of dance. And it's very hard to get our head around it. So I wish I had Randy's mind. Anyway, we have to mind the gap between money and economy, but we also have to see that they're interwoven. OK, so what is money? I mean, money is a real thing. And money has a certain existence apart from simple production and circulation of commodities. Uh, money is not just currency, however. Currency is a very small part of total money, in fact, is less than 1% in the modern economy. So we tend to think of money as this very real and tangible thing, but it's not. It's actually a very intangible, uh, abstract, or virtual thing. Most of it is on account books, which is why we get Paolo to tell us about the world of accounting, which is a mystical world. Uh, and it's money of account. And money, the history of money shows money to have been a money of account going back to early Mesopotamia. And it still is a money of account before its currency. It doesn't work the other way around. It wasn't dug up as gold and silver. And then we figured out how to abstract from that. And that, unfortunately, is the kind of uh, the just-so stories of Adam Smith and the 
bourgeois economists say, well, we were truck, trucking and bartering, and we needed something to do it with, so we invented money. And that's not right. And, and Marx's view and the view of a lot of uh, conventional hard money theory is, well, you dug it up out of the ground, it became a commodity, and then it circulated, and then we abstracted. It was just one commodity amongst many. It was conveniently turned into money. But that's not true. Money of account has existed for hundreds and even thousands of years. It's an abstraction. It's a real abstraction, as Marx would say. And therefore, it is real, but it is virtual. And money, of course, depends, has, depends on, historically on the power of the state. It still depends on the power of the state fundamentally. But there's also a power of money. Money has a certain sovereignty, as Ingham says, especially modern money, which is not reducible simply to the power of the state but actually rests in the power of the economy, which is, I'll come to. Now, money is created, it's not dug up out of the ground, it's created, new money is created all the time through credit. And so money arises as a promise to pay. And so money is both in the present and in the future. So futurism is already present in the very creation of money. And this is true whether it's state money and arises through the national debt, or it's private money or bank money. And banks create money all the time by making loans, by giving you a checkbook, by giving you a credit card. And in fact, credit cards and checks are the main form of money that we all use, although that just begins to scratch the surface of the total quantity of money out there. So money arises, and mo modern money arises alongside the development of the modern economy, but it is, has a separate history of the development of credit, merchant credit, bills of exchange, early banks in the Italian city-states, uh, the development of banking exchanges in, in Holland and in London and so on. And it's a very interesting history and one that we have to take seriously. Now today, uh, money of course has this vast existence that most of us are not even aware of. It uh, is created in any number of ways. The Federal Reserve and the Treasury try to measure money and they have all these numbers they give it. There's M1, M2, M3 through, it goes at least to M10. I think it goes up sometimes to M13. And during the monetarist phase in the 1980s, they really tried to pin this down. But it turns out you can't pin it down. That there is a sort of an essential elasticity of money, uh, a kind of essential limitlessness of money, which is captured by these in, uh, increasingly abstract notions of what the total money in existence is. And of course, there are struggles over the quantity of money. There are struggles between bankers, between creditors and debtors, historically, over how much money is out there. And the debasement of the currency or the um, illegalization of counterfeiting are all battles over the quantity of money. When the populace wanted free silver, they wanted more money, and the bankers wanted less money, and so on. So there's, this, there's a class struggle over the very existence and creation and quantity of money. But now, um, this so far is a story that's drawn from the sort of tra dissenting tradition of money, autonomy of money. But I want to talk about the relation of money to uh, capital and the money to the modern economy. So money rises along with the modern economy, and the amount of money and the regularity of money uh, increases uh, with the, the rise of the modern economy and with the general production and circulation of commodities. As Marx says, circulation sweats money from every pore. So circulation requires money as a means of exchange, as a measure of value, as a store of value, and so on. And money starts to really uh, step forward in the uh, early modern period and become a a different kind of force, a much more regularized force than ancient money. And of course, uh, plays an essential role in all modern economies. Now, where does that power of money come from? Is it just a functionality of the circulation of commodities? And I would argue that here we need value theory. And this is what, um, what the Keynesians and the dissenters continually deny that the circulation, modern production circulation of commodities actually gives rise to the necessary abstract measurement of value. And that all poli classical political economists agreed to this. This isn't just Marx. This is all of them, right through Adam Smith, who realized you needed some kind of objective theory of value, that, that value is produced and it, and it then 
um, is measured in the market. And it, of course, they chose labor value, which was a totally reasonable assumption in a world of small commodity production. Halfway. Small commodity production in the 17th, 18th century is basically labor production. Now, the whole thing gets much more complicated with the rise of modern industry. And by the time Marx writes about it, it's become so convoluted, it's, it's, you know, it's like Ptolemaic wheels within wheels, which are very good predictors of the movement of the planets, but the theory is still wrong. But I won't go into that. Uh, but what we get is a kind of dance of the real abstractions, as Marx calls value is a real abstraction. Money is also real abstraction. And in a sense, the real abstraction of, of value transmits to modern money its force, the force of the production and circulation of commodities. Now, what's weird about this is that although Marx says that uh, commodity production, circulation, and value sweats money from every poor, he then kind of neglects the theory of money in many ways, although I'll show you that he doesn't completely neglect it. So my next point is about money and capital. That commodity circulation for Marx inevitably leads to the rise of capitalism. That is, CMC, the use of money simply as a means of exchange, becomes transcended by MCM, the reversal, that you can actually invest in money and make more money. And people start to realize that. And this fateful inversion is inherent, is imminent in the dialectical logic of the dance of money and commodities. Marx also, of course, he goes on to talk about the secret of surplus value, and that's where all Marxists run off, and they get very excited about that, and they say, ah, oh, it's ex exploitation of labor. But they forget that Marx, in the meantime, also explains the secret of accumulation. And this is every bit as important, that accumulation is driven by money, it's made possible by money, and it's essentially infinite. Long before Marx ever talks about competition as a driver of accumulation, he talks about how accumulation, modern accumulation, is inherently infinite. And it leads capitalists to always want to pursue the spiral accumulation because money is this infinite measure of wealth. And if you can get your hands on money, there is no limit to how much you can get. So that's a key insight. And Marx then also goes on to with this key insight that capital then comes to be the center of the universe of the modern economy. And this is an insight which, of course, is completely lacking in orthodox or even Keynesian e economics, that capital is the moving force. And capital accumulation is the moving force that makes everything dance. But where's the money? After the beginning of volume one and the, and the secret of surplus value, money kind of drops away. In volume two, when Marx talks about the circuits of capital, he hardly talks about money. And he only comes back in volume three to talk about uh, money making and, and, and money as a, a share of the total surplus value. But he gets himself in a lot of knots in volume three because it is, seems that it's actually more than that. But there we have to follow Marx this time into the secret abode of money making by money. Now in Marxism, you notice I have 5.5 here because I'm, I'm lying. How am I doing on time? Uh, you have five minutes. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm fine. Um, that, super. Um, that Marx talks briefly in the beginning of Capital about the short circuit. Of, of the circuit of capital. Instead of going M, C, P, C, M prime, you just go M, M prime. And all Marxists have sneered at this and said, ah, just shows you, you know, those dirty financiers who just try to make money out of money, and they don't take it very seriously, this idea of money breeding money. But if we take money as a world, a world that has some existence apart from capital, then money breeding money, we've already seen, happens all the time. Money is bred all the time through the creation of credit. So is this an aberration, or is it actually the norm that finance capital and money would try to breed money? What's more is that money and the finance, financial capital learns from capital, you might say, or takes up the banner of capital. Because capital teaches the owners of the means of production and the owners of money the fantastic possibilities of the secret of surplus value, that you can make your capital expand. So why wouldn't the, the money capitalists pursue that too? Why wouldn't they seek to exploit surplus value? Why wouldn't they seek self-expansion of money? And of course, their self-interest, uh, and the, uh, really, uh, it, 
tells him to do that. And it's interesting, the whole pantheon of Marxist theorists, I remember reading as a, as a young um, sprout, reading Paul Sweezy and Harry Magdoff, who were the only ones I could find who said, you know, financiers have a direct interest in expanding the financial world. And we better take that seriously. And indeed, we should. Now, there are three modes of the self-expansion of money, and what I'm going to call lending, fictitious capital, and financial assets, which gives, brings me back to my 10 points here, number six. So first of all, money and exploitation. Money exploits. Money has the power to suck out surplus value, to take its cut of the surplus, as Marx realizes in volume three, discuss in volume three. And that, of course, that surplus can come from labor, it can come from capitalists, it can come from small farmers, it can come from any point in the compass of the real economy. Now, there's two basic elemental forms of exploitive power of money. One is lending and getting interest, which is very ancient. That's not modern at all, but becomes, of course, very systematic in the modern economy. And then, of course, what we also see is servicing. You know, banks service your money, and they charge you all, the time, all kinds of fees, which is basically taking money out of your pocket, although they'll say, well, you know, it costs us a lot to run those ATMs. But you know it's not true. And of course, the question is, once you talk about the rate of interest, like the rate of wages and the rate of profit, is what determines that? And of course, orthodox economics says, well, supply and demand. And even Marx at times sort of says, well, yeah, interest is set in supply and demand. But that goes against everything else Marx teaches, which is where equal rights collide, force decides. And interest rates, fees, are always up for grabs. There is no predetermined natural rate of interest or equilibrium rate of interest. It's it's the struggle over how much you can pull out of people's pockets. And this is true for rent, by the way, but I won't go off on rent theory, and profit of enterprise. What about credit and capital? Now, capital investment is a funny thing. It's always both, you know, you're laying out of money, but it's always speculative. It's always a, a, a gamble on the future. This isn't just something invented by derivatives. We've always been, capitalist economy is inherently a risk economy and a futurist economy, which has only been amplified by the derivatives and so on. Uh, David Harvey points this out very nicely in his book, The Limits of Capital. He also talks about a concept of fictitious capital, that is, by borrowing, capitalists can expand the amount of capital and literally create the future. They invest in the future, and by investing in the future, they make it present. They make it happen. In that sense, capitalists are always futurists. And, or Randy was saying, you know, we create value before it's time, or the value is imminent. That's exactly right. That's what capitalism is doing all the time. And by using credit, it can accelerate. I mean, capitalism itself accelerates the rush to the future. But with credit provided by money, by the money capitalists, it accelerates all that. Now, Harvey then goes back and says, well, this is fictitious capital, which is kind of a nice concept, except that it, it makes it sound as if money isn't real, that the, that the money that was lent isn't real. But that is real money. As soon as you create money and credit, it's real money. So I think we had, again, keep the tension of the real and the fictive here. And credit money, because credit money accelerates accumulation, what finance capital is doing now, it's not just passive interest or just kind of interest today, it's actually helping to create the future and taking a cut from capital's ability to accelerate accumulation. Which then brings me to the third form of, of monetary ex exploitation, which is through financial assets. The whole parallel world that we've been talking about a lot here, of where you have these paper representations or digital representations of real things, of real capital, real assets, and real streams of income, which then can be traded and securitized. And there's three functions of the asset markets. And one is to create new credit. But as Doug Hanwood points out, that's very small. What it's really there for is to provide a way for money capital to invest in income streams, its power of exploitation, and invest in asset values themselves, that these values tend to go up over time. You can invest in them and make money through asset uh, appreciation. So asset values and the power of money uh, over the real economy is interesting because power starts to 
Money necessarily penetrates the real economy through the financialization of everything. I mean, this is part of the logic, it seems to me, of money and exploitation. It also, though, part of the logic is to keep asset values going up and even use credit to force asset values to short circuit MM prime. And just to come back to the fact that this is real, uh, we have what Bob Brenner calls the wealth effect, you know, the stock market capitalism, that if you get the wealth effect of asset values, you can actually see that that can use, be used to stimulate the economy in the same way that Keynes says, well, if the government just prints money, it can stimulate the economy. Well, if the asset system, asset markets print money, they can stimulate the economy too. Which then brings me to my last two points, finance capital and financialization. Finance capital, of course, is the embodiment, the institutionalization of everything I've been talking about, the institutional forms. And these, and these institutions are both the bearers of, of the power of money and they're agents of the power of money. And they're the lively pursuit of monetary gain, as Karen Ho points out, constructs the whole financial world. But I would also say in reverse that these guys are the bearers of the social power of money, the real abstraction as Marx puts it, that this is always, they're always both. It's always an agency and a bearer of a, a social structure and a social power. And of course, these guys have every interest in the elaboration of the financial universe. So over time, we would expect to see the growing power of the financial capitalists, the financial corporations, growing size, growing concentration, growing power over the state. Which then brings me to the last question, is the specter of our times is, has finance dominating production? Are we in an era of finance capitalism where finance capitalism has trumped industrial capitalism? Now in Marxism, this sort of isn't possible. And yet the evidence all around us is that of this immense share of activity, of uh, evaluation of the capital stock and of the profits, and along with it, the growing debt load, financialization, asset bubbles, and everything else. Now, of course, there is the crisis side of this. And there's two sort of approaches to the crisis side. One is, the, is that finance bloats itself up, the fictitious, hyperactive bloating of finance, which Harvey talks about. It's imminent in the fictitious capital that that it can run, run amok, but it eventually has to come back to earth. It eventually has to be restored to the true value of the real economy. And that's Harvey's theory of crisis. Conversely, Bob Brenner has a very similar theory of overaccumulation, says, well, actually the rise of finance is just a way of covering up for the, what's a staggering, stagnating real economy. Now, all these things are true. I'm not saying they're not true, and of course, the financial bubble burst. But at the end of the day, the finance, financial system has not gone away. It's still bigger than it ever was. And so then we have to ask our question, is this just a parasitic, is it like the mistletoe that's about to kill the oak tree but looks really green in present day? Or is this really part of the long-term logic of the growth of capitalism? And that that logic was interrupted. It was recognized in the early 20th century, but it was interrupted by the Great Depression, the collapse of the Great Depression, and the, the New Deal, and social uh, and uh, welfare capitalism and social democracy, and now we're back on track with financialization and the growth of the finance of finance capitalism. Simply a normal part, just like the rise of the modern corporation. In another 20 years, we won't even have this discussion. Thank you. <laughs>